Okay, so secret of platform 13 and we're on chapter 4. The third rescuer was lying behind a screen being tested by the doctor. Hans was an ogre, a one-eyed giant, a most simple and kindly person who lived in the mountains putting things right for the goats, collecting feathers for his hat and yodeling. As giants go, he was not very big, but anyone bigger would not have been able to get through the door of the gentleman's cloakroom. Even so, at a metre taller than an ordinary person, he would have been noticed, so it had been decided to make him an invisible for the journey. This was no problem, as everyone knows that people can be made invisible, but just a few people can't take it on their skin. They come out in lumps and bumps or develop a rash, and it has to and, it has, and the ogre skin had to be tested by the doctor to make sure that he would be okay to have the cream. Now he came out carrying his black bag and beaming. All is well, your majesties, he said. There will be no ill effects at all. Hans followed shyly. The ogre always wore leather shorts and embroidered braces, and they could see on his huge pink thigh a patch of pure, clear nothingness. But he was looking a little worried. My eye, he said. I wish not seed in my eye. He spoke in short sentences and with a foreign accent because his people long ago had come through the gump in the Austrian Alps. Everyone understood this. <coughs> if you have only one eye, it really matters. I don't think anyone will notice a single eye floating in the air, said the chief advisor. And if they do, he could always shut it. So this was settled and the palace secretary handed Cornelius a map of London underground and a briefcase full of money. There was always plenty of that because the people who came through the gum brought it to the treasury, not having any use for it on the island, and the king now gave his orders. You know already that no magic must be used directly on the prince, he said, and the rescuers nodded. The queen, king and queen liked ruling over a place where unusual things happened, but they themselves were completely human and could only manage if they kept magic strictly out of their private lives. As for the rest, I think you understand what you have to do. Make your way quietly to the Trottle's house and find the so-called Raymond. If he is ready to come at once, return immediately and make your way down the tunnel. But if he needs time... How could he need time? cried the Queen. How could he need time? The thought that her son might not want to come to her at once hurt her so much that she could barely catch her breath. Nevertheless, my dear, it may be a shock to him, and if so, he turned back to the rescuers, you have a day or two to get him used to the idea. But whatever you do, don't delay more than that. He was interrupted by a knock on the door, and a palace servant entered. Excuse me, your majesties, but there is someone waiting at the gates. She has been here for hours, and though I've explained that you are busy, she simply will not go away. Who is it? asked the Queen. A little girl, Your Majesty. She has a suitcase full of sandwiches and a book and says she will wait all night if necessary. The King frowned. <laughs> you had better show her in, he said. Odge entered and bobbed a curtsy. She looked grim and determined and carried a suitcase with the words Odge Gribble, had printed on the side. The Queen smiled, almost a proper smile, now that she was soon to see her son. Aren't you Mrs Gribble's youngest, she said in a soft voice. Yes, I am. And what can I do for you, my dear? Your sisters are well, I trust. Odge scowled. Her sisters were very well, showing off, shrieking, flapping, digging the garden with their long fingernails and generally making her feel bad. But this was no time for her own problems. I want you to let me go with the rescuers and fetch the prince, said Odge. I wrote a letter about it. The king sec secretary now stepped forward and said that Miss Gribble had indeed offered her services, but he had felt that her youth made her unsuitable. The king nodded and the queen said gently, you are too young, my dear. You must see that yourself. I am the same age as the prince, said Odge, almost, and I think it would be nice for him to have someone young. The rescuers have already been chosen, said the king. Yes, I know, but I don't take up much room, and I think I know how he might feel. Raymond Trottle, I mean. How? asked the queen eagerly. Well, a bit muddled. I mean, he thinks he's a trottle, and he thinks Mrs. Trottle is, is his mother, and... But she isn't, she isn't. She's a wicked woman and a thief. Yes, that's true, said Odge. 
But if he's a royal prince, it will be difficult for him to hate his mother. And she broke off, not wanting to say more. It could be a dangerous journey, said the queen. Odge drew herself up to her full height, which was not very great. Her green eye glinted and her brown eye glared. I am a hag, she said huffily. I am Odge with the tooth. She stepped forward and opened her mouth very wide and the queen could indeed see a glimmer of blue right at the back. Darkness and danger is meat and drink to hags. The king and queen knew this was to be true and it was absurd to send such a little girl. It was out of the question. Sometimes I cough frog, said Odge, and blushed because it wasn't true. Once she had coughed something that she thought might be a tadpole, but it hadn't been. Why do you want to go, asked the king. I just want to, said Odge. I want to so much that I feel it must be meant. There was a long pause. Then the queen said, Odge, if you were allowed to go, what would you say to the prince when you first saw him? I wouldn't say anything, said Odge. I'd bring him a present. What kind of present, asked the king. Odge told him. Well, this is it, said Ernie Hobbs, floating past the boarded up left luggage office and coming to rest on an old mailbag. This is the day. He was a thin ghost with a drooping moustache, still dressed in his railway porter's uniform he'd worn when he worked in the station. Ernie hated the newfangled luggage trolleys, taking the bread out of the mouths of honest men who used to carry people's suitcases. He also had a sorrow because after his, he died, his wife had married again. And when he went to haunt his old house, Ernie could see a man called Albert Fisher sitting in Ernie's old chair with a napkin tied around his neck, eating the burgers and mash that Ernie's wife had cooked for him. All the same, Ernie was a hero. He, it was he who had seen Mrs. Trottle snatch the baby prince outside the fish shop and tried to glide over the Rolls Royce to stop her. And when that hadn't worked, he bravely floated through the gunk, although wind tunnels do awful things to stuff that ghosts are made of, and brought the dreadful news to the sailors waiting in the cove. Since then, for nine long years, Ernie and the other station ghosts had kept watch on the Trottles' house, and now they waited to welcome the rescuers and show them the way. Are you going to say anything, asked Mrs Partridge, about, you know, Raymond? She was an older ghost than Ernie, and remembered the war and how friendly everyone had been, with the soldiers crowding the station and always ready for a chat. Being a spectre suited her. Her legs had been dreadful when she was alive, all swollen and sore from scrubbing floors all day, and she never got over feeling as free and light as air. Ernie shook his head. Don't think so, he said. No point in upsetting them. They'll find out soon enough. Mrs. Partridge nodded. She never believed in making trouble, and a very pale, frail ghost called Miriam Hughes agreed. She'd been an apologising lady, one of those people whose voices came over the loudspeaker all day saying sorry to travellers because their trains are late. No one can do that for long and stay healthy, and she died quite young of sadness and pneumonia. They were a close band, the spectres who haunted Platform 13, the ghosts of the gump, they called themselves, and they didn't have much to trust with outsiders. There was a ghost of a train spotter called Brian, who'd got between the buffers and the 915 from Petersburger and the ghost of the old woman who'd lost her umbrella and still hovered over the left luggage office, keeping an eye on it. And there were other hauntings shyly in various places of the station, not wanting to put themselves forward, but ready to lend a hand if they were needed. The hands of the great clock moved slowly forward. Not the clock on platform 13, which was covered in cobwebs, but that of the main one, 11.30, 11.45, gentleman's cloakroom moved slowly, slowly to one side. A hole appeared, a deep, dark hole, and from it came swirls of mist and very faintly the smell of the sea. <coughs> Mrs. Partridge clutched Ernie's arm. Oh, I'm so excited, she whispered. And indeed it was exciting. It was awesome. The dark hole, the swirling mist, and now in the hole there appeared figures, three of them, and hovering high above them, a clear blue eye. Welcome, said Ernie Hobbs. He bowed, the woman curtsied, and the rescuers stepped forward into the light. It has, it has to be said that the ghosts were surprised. They knew that the prince was to be brought back without a fuss, but they had expected, well, something a bit fiercer. 
Of course, they could see that the ancient gentleman now tottering towards them was a wizard. His face was very wise, and there seemed to be astrological signs on his long, dark cloak. Through when they looked more carefully, they saw that they were pieces of old spaghetti and tomato sauce. The wizard's ear trumpet, which he wore on a string around his neck, had tangled with the cord holding his spectacles so that it looked as if he might choke to death before he even got onto the mission. And though they could see a place on his shoulder where a mighty eagle must have once perched, it was definitely not there anymore. Yet, when he came forward to shake hands with them, the ghosts were impressed. How you shake hands with a ghost matters, because of course you feel nothing, and someone who isn't a true gentleman can just wave his hands about in mid-air and make a ghost feel really small. I am Cornelius the Mighty, said Cor, and I bring thanks from the Majesties for your guardianship of the gump. He then intru introduced Gertrude. The Fay was wearing a large hat decorated with flowers, but also with a single beetroot. It was a living beetroot. Gerky would never have worn anything that was dead, and she carried a straw basket full of important things for gardening, a watering can, some brown paper bags, a roll of twine. The ghosts knew all about these healing ladies who go about making things better for everyone, and they had seen fairy godmothers in the pantomime. But Mrs. Partridge was a bit worried about the hat. The beetroot suited Gerky. It went with her kind pink face, but of course, vegetables are not warm very much in London. But it was the third person who puzzled the ghosts of the gump particularly. Why had the islanders of the land sent a little girl? Odge's thick black hair had been yanked into two pigtails and she wore a pleated gym slip and a blazer with play up and play the game embroidered on the pocket. The uniform was an exact copy of the one that the girls of St Agnes wore in the photograph that Gerky's mother had had on her mantelpiece. But the ghosts did not know that, nor did they understand why the suitcase she was clutching, holding it out in front of her like a tea tray, was punched full of holes. Fortunately, the eye, at least, belonged to the kind of rescuer they had expected. Because they themselves were often invisible, the ghosts could make out the shape of the ogre even though he was covered in fern seed. They could see his enormous sledgehammer fists, and while the embroidered braces went, pity they thought that he would be, do very well as a bodyguard. Cornelius now explained that they were disguised as ordinary human family. I am a retired university professor, Gertrude is my niece who works for the Ministry of Agriculture, and Odge is her goddaughter on her way to boarding school. As for the ogre, he told them he would stay invisible, closing his eye if necessary, but not, they hoped, to bump into things. And the dear boy Gertrude now asked eagerly, Dear little Raymond, he is well? There was a pause while Ernie and Mrs Partridge looked at each other, and the ghost of the apologising lady stared at the ground. He's very well, said Ernie. In the pink, put in Mrs Partridge, and knows nothing. Nothing, agreed Ernie, nothing. It now struck the rescuers that there was very little bustle around the gentleman's cloakroom and that this was unusual. Last time the gump had opened, there'd been a stream of people going down. Tree spirits, whose trees had got Dutch elm disease, water nymphs, whose ponds had dried up, and just ordinary people who were fed up with the pollution and the noise. But when they pointed this out to Ernie, he said, maybe they'll come later, there's nine days to go. Actually, he didn't think they'd come later. He didn't think they'd come at all, and he knew why. Let us plunge into the bowels of the earth, said Cornelius, who wanted to be on his way. But the underground had stopped running, and so had the buses. And I wouldn't advise waking Raymond Trotlin in the middle of the night, said Ernie. I wouldn't advise that at all. So it was decided that they would walk to Trottle Towers and rest in the park till morning. There was a little summer house hidden in the bushes and close to Raymond's back door where nobody would find them. The only problem was the wizard, who was too tottery to go far, and the giant soul solved that by saying, I will pig him on my back. This seemed a good idea, of course. They'd have to watch out for people who'd be surprised to see an old gentleman having a piggyback in mid-air. But as the ghosts were coming along to show them the way, that wouldn't be difficult. Odge had gone back into the cloakroom to do something to her suitcase. They could hear a tap running and her voice talking to someone. Now, as she stomped after the others down the platform, Ernie took a closer look at her. At the unequal eyes, 
the fierce black eyebrows which met in the middle, at a glimmer of blue as she yawned. Not just a little girl then, a hag. Well, they could do with one of these when coming with them, thought Ernie Hobbs. They could do with a hag when dealing with the trottles. Okay, we'll leave it there. So I think you've got to go back to the lesson.